Welcome back, everybody, for another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have David Bakai and Ben Moll with us. Hi, David. Hi, Ben. David and Ben will present uh, some work they did together with many others from Germany on the, titled What if Germany is cut off from Russian oil and gas and studying essentially the implications on the German economy. So we all talk about sanctions. We're all worried about the situation in Ukraine. And uh, let's think more deeply, you know, how this will impact the German economy if uh, there's a cutoff of Russian energy. First, I've listed here the names of the authors. So to give credit to all of them and uh, David and uh, Ben are here for them. And what they point out correctly is that, you know, coal, coal oil and natural gas are very different animals because coal and oil can be traded on the world market. So what you do is, you know, is just substitute with other suppliers. And uh, that also has a different implications for Russia. Russia can just sell to other customers. So if uh, China and India are willing to buy the oil from Russia, then it's not, the big, not so costly for them. And it's also not so costly for the West to impose the sanctions. The situation is very different for gas because it's more local, it's more regional, depends on pipelines. So you have to find some different energy sources. So you can't just substitute with different suppliers and you need terminals um, and uh, to get uh, liquefied natural gas uh, into the right place. So that's a more difficult situation. So situation is depends very much what source of energy it is. But essentially when you have low cost of uh, sanctions, there's also low effectiveness because the other party can get around it. If they're high costs, then there might be also a high effectiveness. Now, the big question among the others is, should we do it or should we not do it? What are the implications? But there's also a dynamic dimension to it. Do you want to have some so-called blitz sanctions? So you just go cold Turkey right away, uh, very harsh. That will be most effective as Russia cannot adjust, but it will be also most costly for the West as the West cannot adjust. And essentially it's most effective because Russia cannot redirect all the supply to other countries, and it might lead to a quick military withdrawal if one hits very quickly, very hard. That's one uh, interpretation. But it might also mean if it doesn't work, then it means in the long run, the sanctions might be less sustainable. And the question is, do you want to build up some reserves to sustain sanctions in the long run? And you might be worried, you know, if Trump is reelected in 2024 and is less interested in NATO, uh, you know, wars typically can last decades. And that's essentially, uh, you know, something to think about as well. So this, uh, there's some trade-offs here to consider. And it's not obvious, but of course, it goes beyond uh, economics to make a judgment call on that. Now, in general, in economics, we can think of two studies. And the first one is a macroeconomic approach. You really try to estimate the substitutability across sectors and try to how easily can you get free yourself from natural gas in particular and replace it with other energies and also replace the products which are very gas dependent with other products. An alternative approach is a much more detailed approach where you look at the physics directly, uh, you know, look at the gas pipelines, how it's transported from one spot to another spot. Can you bring it there or not? Um, you, it matters how the gas pressure is in the pipelines. If the pressure drops too much, it might not work anymore. So you have a much more physical detailed approach. And next week we will do, and going these details uh, with Elena Ribakova, who is actually an expert on sanctions, has studied sanctions uh, for many, many years and uh, will go also into financial sanctions. So we will have more uh, than next uh, week on this as well. Today, we will focus on the macro approach, but of course we have to keep in mind there might be unintended consequences. I was told that the Ukrainian diesel for the Ukrainian military comes mostly from Poland, while Poland's uh, oil to make diesel comes from Russia. So essentially if you cut off the Russian oil to Poland, it might be harder to supply the diesel for the Ukrainian military. So there are a lot of details which need to be uh, figured out. But today, I think today's approach, we will do a lot on substitutability. So let me just uh, bring everybody on board, uh, just highlighting few simple points. 
uh, before we give the floor to Ben and to David. So here, what I have, I have on the x-axis how much gas uh, you have to produce something, and you can substitute it for some other input. And they have drawn an ISO equant, which essentially says if you want to produce the same amount, uh, that's you know how much you can move things around, how much you can substitute. So if you move along this white line, you cut back on the gas input, you have to increase the alternative substitutes by this amount. So that's essentially given this production, which is represented by this um, isoquant here, you can see that the reduction in gas will, in order to compensate this to get the same output, you have to increase some other input by, by this amount. Now, if you have a different production technology, like represented by this green isoquant, so which is, you know, uh, more curved, but then if you cut back the gas input by the same amount, you have to input much more of the substitute uh, than compared to the blue one. So the green one has lower substitutability compared to the blue one. And of course, you can go very extreme. And the very extreme version is when you have what we refer to as uh, Leontief um, production functions. Uh, then you have actually a kink here. So it's like, if you want to cut back a gas, you can't do it at all because you need an infinite amount of the substitute. And this way you cannot really substitute it as well uh, as uh, a way at all. Now, my first comment is that, you know, when we estimate this elasticity of substitution, so how much substitutability do we have, uh, you know, how curved are the isoquants? How much do we need to replace them? Like what we had in, in this blue one, we might be in a situation where the situation is curved, slightly curved in, where around the point we are, but at some point it becomes very steep. So the estimate, the local estimate, might be not a good guidance what it happens after a big shock, or put it differently, there are nonlinearities in the elasticities. So that's depicted here on this, on this green line, uh, isoquant here. So it's very normal around the point where we are. But if you move further away, then it becomes like a Leontief, very steep. And so then it becomes very different. So it's very difficult to figure out, you know, when you make your local estimates, how they will hold for global, for global large shocks. And that might lead to some non-resilience and substitutability where saying, oh, actually there's some resilience there, there's some substitutability there, but if it goes too far, uh, it might not work anymore. So to go back to some earlier webinar we had with Jim Hamilton, one way to test for that is to use this method on the 1973 oil shock from OPEC. So just to give you some uh, comparisons, the current world supply for oil, not for gas, just simply for oil, coming from Russia is 13%. Well, and if you shut it down, all the 13% are gone. Uh, if they're not substituted away, you know, move to China. If they move to China, then it's not, it's a wash. It doesn't change anything. So rather than going to the West, that goes to China. And at the end, it's not costly. Uh, for Russia, it doesn't benefit uh, anyone that gaps China getting oil cheaper. But essentially, if you shut it off worldwide, it will be a reduction by 13%. The OPEC shock was an oil supply reduction by 7%. And that's uh, the slide I took from Jim Hamilton's presentation, where he shows in 1973 how the oil production went down at the maximum drawdown was about 7%. So it would be interesting to see how things uh, moved at that time, how the estimates would work at that time, because we know how the economy uh, reacted if we just do a counterfactual at that time. And one would argue now in 2022, we're much less oil dependent than we were in the early 70s, but we could also put the counter argument forward that we have already squeezed out the, the last efficiency unit of oil uh, or any uh, gas and other things. So that to get that extra efficiency unit out, it will be much more complicated uh, in this sense. Now, these elasticities are interesting. <clears throat> the question is how do they aggregate? And here have a simple example just to show some complications which emerge. So here if a production, there's an upstream firm and there's another upstream firm, and then there's a downstream firm taking as input the outputs from the two upstream firms and then producing an output. So in the simple example, what I did is I just assumed there's Leontief production functions upstream in both uh, upstream companies. So that's, yeah, there's no substitutability between gas and the other input X. 
and there's no substitutability between the input y and the gas in this this other sector so you can't substitute at all but you know the firm in downstream can substitute between this firm and that firm's input so the output of this firm is an input for this downstream firm and the output of this firm is an input for the downstream firm as well so here i assume the substitutability at the downstream firm now if there is leonte uh, up there and if it's 50 50 let's say for simplicity but then actually substitutability doesn't help much so you also get overall the aggregate uh, elasticity of substitution is also leonte so it's also there's no substitutability on the other hand if you know there's 60 40 here and there's 50 50 over there but then actually you can shift across the two inputs and this way you get uh, substitutability in, in the aggregate. So it's very subtle how the substitutability aggregates over time. The other thing I would like to emphasize, if you cannot move gas from this company and that location to gas to that lo location, then it's actually uh, more problematic as well. So one has to take this transportability of uh, the gas into account as well. Finally, I would like to make a, a quick point about the production chains. So we had already a very short production chain, but we can have um, a longer production chain. So here is like a long production chain. And if you have an O-ring theory saying, oh, if, if something goes wrong, the whole chain goes down. So if there's a shock at the top of the chain, but then the whole thing uh, might, be back, might be going down. That's the question is, when we compare to the COVID crisis, the shock was at the final sector, consume facing the consumer in energy, it's much more upstream. But it's not clear at all whether that's a drawback or an advantage. So in a sense, it's a drawback because if you have an O-ring, no substitutability up there, and you can't substitute much at all, it a little bit of a disruption kills the whole chain and makes the whole chain go away. It has much bigger amplification effects. On the other hand, if there is substitutability at each stage of this chain, so you can also substitute at each uh, stage of this chain as well, and then it plays out very difficult. So you can see it's very subtle how uh, the substitutability aggregate over time. And uh, David, uh, of course, is an expert on this dimension. Now, Finally, I would like to say something about financial frictions and how financial frictions add to the complications even further. So you might have some adjustment frictions and ideally company A should actually scale back because it uses so much gas and company B should scale up because it uses some renewable energies and should actually scale up its production. But because of financial frictions, company B can't get financing. So it's not so easy to get the finance, doesn't have the collateral or any other while company A, because of this high gas prices, will actually go bankrupt. So in an ideal world, without financial frictions, company A would just scale back and company B would scale up. But what we'll have with financial frictions potentially is company A will go bankrupt, scales back, of course, dramatically, and company B cannot scale up because it has financial friction. So an aggregate, it might be much worse. Now let me go to the poll questions Ben and David have put forward. And these are the questions uh, they were asking you. And the first question was, following an import stop of Russian energy, so everything, coal, oil, and gas, everything together, how much will the German GDP decline relative to not doing anything and just leaving the economy running as it is uh, now or was before any sanctions were imposed? And the answers were, um, so less than 1%, it's 7%. Let me go to the other extreme, more than 10% thought, 10% people thought more than 10% uh, the economy will tank. We forgot to put the five to 10% in, so I'm not saying anything, but one to 3% was 36%, three to 5% was 47%. So you can see uh, most people think it's in the range between one and, and five or perhaps above five, uh, and 10% thought it's above 10% in terms of GDP. Now, if we do alternatively, we impose some 40% tariff on ration energy and had the same question again, just instead of total ban uh, called Turkey, let's do a, a tariff like what Ricardo Hausmann proposed and we covered this uh, earlier in the Jim Hamilton webinar. But then the answers were the different and the answers going to the same numbers were 27% said less than 1%. So it's way more moderate. 
41% thought 1 to 3%, 20% thought 3 to 5%, and 11% thought 5 to 10%. And um, more than 10%, essentially only one person asked answered that. So it was very, uh, very unlikely that we would tank the economy by more than 10%. Finally, the final question was about the implications of doing a cold turkey uh, cutoff uh, of all energy supplies from Russia. Um, what's the implications on inflation? Less than 2%, that's what 26% thought. 2 to 4%, that's 53%. Uh, a big majority thought 2 to 4% extra percentage points on top of the inflation we have. And more than 6%, uh, that's what 20% uh, thought this way. So, um, I'll leave with that and I pass on the floor to Ben and to David, and uh, they will uh, present the results to us and we will have questions during the presentation. Thanks again to David and Ben, and we're looking forward to the presentation. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Marcus, for having us. Thanks, everyone, so much for coming. Uh, really exciting to be here. Um, so I'll do the first part, then David will do the middle, and I'll do the conclusion. So we'll switch back and forth a bit. So as Marcus already said, this is a, a joint work with a large team of uh, sort of cutting across different subfields in economics. That's why it's so many people in a sense. Um, okay, so you know what are the objectives of this paper? Um, I mean, Marcus has already said a lot of this, um, but essentially our goal was just to assess the economic consequences for Germany of a cutoff uh, from uh, uh, Russian energy imports um, and there's sort of two reasons why you think that may be important. The first one is uh, either Germany or the EU may implement an embargo um, you know, from our side, or I guess the other reason why it's important is you know, it's conceivable that Putin will sort of uh, uh, switch off the gas tap um, from his side. Um, our goal here was sort of to uh, provide a, a worst case assessment of uh, sort of an extreme assessment of a cold turkey complete import stop. And, uh, you know, I'll come back to this. It's not because we think, for example, a full embargo is necessarily the best thing to do. It's sort of the idea was to maybe bound other scenarios. For example, you'd think that maybe with a tariff uh, uh, that would be bounded above by the sort of cold turkey import stop. And uh, the other reason is that, you know, less extreme policies like a tariff may then still trigger a full stop uh, from the Russian side. Okay. The basic you know, philosophy here was we wanted to get a sense of the rough magnitudes of economic losses um, uh, from doing such a, from having such, such an input stop relative to a do nothing baseline. And I guess here's some possibilities. This is sort of similar a bit to the, to the poll that we had. So you may think maybe there's small, the small GDP decline, uh, say 0.5 to 1% uh, relative to baseline, given there's you know, growth in the baseline, um, you could imagine maybe not even a recession. Uh, maybe you think it's going to be like the COVID recession, that size of magnitude in Germany, that was a four and a half percentage point a GDP decline. Maybe you think it's like uh, Spain or Portugal during the Euro crisis. So we, I looked this up, it's like five and 7% GDP loss. And then the other scenario that could potentially be the case um, could be something like mass unemployment and poverty, which for example, in Germany, some politicians have used these words um, on TV to you know, warn about an import stop, um, which to me at least sounds uh, something like a, the Great Depression and definitely a GDP loss of more than 10%. Okay, so th those are kind of, you know, we, we just wanted to have a sense of where are we gonna be in there, okay? Here are the possibilities again. Our headline numbers um, in the paper are essentially a GDP decline between half a percentage point in the most optimistic scenario um, uh, and three percentage points. Okay. So the takeaways here that we want to uh, make is essentially an import stop uh, will be likely somewhat less severe than the COVID recession, which, uh, you know, would be four and a half percentage points. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to say, you know, we, we should be doing this or we should not be doing this. Um, but we want to make the point that in principle, we think Germany is a rich country with a moderate uh, debt to GDP ratio of something like 71%. Um, you know, there's fiscal capacity, so uh, you can potentially, um, you know, do something there and uh, uh, provide insurance and socialize the costs. We did the same thing uh, uh, during COVID. Okay, um, here's something that we're not going to cover in the paper that we wrote, 
um, but I'll talk about a little bit at the end, um, which is uh, uh, the effects of an import stop on inflation, okay, just to, you know, manage expectations a bit. Um, okay. Just to come back to this, I guess, to relate to the poll, so I guess relative to the poll, we're uh, sort of a little bit lower than the average uh, poll respondent, so I guess it's, it's good that I'm presenting this, we have some work to do to convince everyone that uh, essentially, uh, you know, we're sort of in the in, more in the lower part of that uh, 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 range of estimates that people g gave and definitely the people who said more than 10 percentage points, we want to argue uh, uh, it's very hard to make that case. Okay, so um, here's just a graph to show you, um, uh, Marcus already I think sort of had it, uh, German primary energy usage, uh, this is table one in the paper, um, these are the main sort of uh, energy sources up there, uh, in particular fossil fuels, so oil, gas, and coal, um, and then these other energy sources. This is in terawatt hours, and then essentially uh, the, the main thing to look at is how much of that uh, energy comes from Russia. Okay? And you can see, um, especially for oil, gas, and coal, these are large numbers. Uh, in particular for gas here, you have a whopping 55% of all gas in Germany comes from Russia. So you, know, you can see why people are uh, uh, scared to a certain extent. Okay? As Marcus has already said, sort of, um, our argument is uh, that to a certain extent, um, uh, gas is really the, the, the bottleneck, the tricky one, and oil and coal are maybe not so problematic. Uh, the argument is that oil and coal have a global market um, and Germany has strategic reserves. Also, uh, oil and coal, you can you know, put on a ship and move around much easier. Gas, in contrast, is really very much tied to the existing pipeline network, um, uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, supplies in the world as a whole are just kind of small and you, you cannot really substitute this too much. As a result, uh, we're going to focus here really for the paper uh, almost exclu exclusively on gas, again, because in Germany, at least, that's sort of the big elephant in the room uh, is, you know, how, how, what would you do about gas? So Ben, um, can I ask you, there's a question by uh, Bobinger. He would like to know whether your analysis also applies to other European countries like Austria and also to East European countries, in particular, or Central European countries uh, as well. And are there spillover effects from a German economy to, let's say, great, Poland? Great question. Um, we have a slide on this at the very end. Um, we, in fact, did some analysis exactly for the EU as a whole. Uh, we wrote a paper um, for the French Council of Economic Advisors with uh, Camille Landé and Philippe Martin, where we did some sort of exercise exactly for the EU as a whole. So let me, you know, bank the question um, and revisit later. But so, you know, brief answer, yes, in principle, uh, uh, yes, some such analysis also applies to the EU as a whole and uh, these other countries. Okay. So, um, so I said 55% of all gas uh, comes from Russia. Um, you know, what's the size of the gas shock we, we want to think about? So we want to say, okay, you do lose 55% of this gas, but you know some of this you can substitute in, in some way or another. Okay? And here we are relying on our uh, uh, friends, the energy economists on the team, and uh, there's some very nice work by the people at uh, Bruegel uh, on this. Okay? Um, it's important, Marcus said already a little bit, uh, to think about time horizons. So I should have maybe already even said this earlier. So for, for most of our exercises, we're going to want to think of the relevant time horizon essentially roughly until the next winter. Um, why is that? Well, that's because there's a lot of seasonality in gas demand. So in particular, gas demand is much, much higher in the winter when you know households in particular uh, and also firms use it to heat a lot. Um, so we already know basically um, that we're probably going to be fine over the summer. Um, so the, the question will be, some, you know, how much extra gas will we be able to get roughly until next winter? And also, um, you know, then going forward, uh, when we think about substitutability along the production chain, how much can you do there in terms of that type of substitution uh, until next winter? So we're talking time horizons, you know, nine months, seven, eight months, uh, uh, definitely less than a year. Uh, the idea is, you know, some of these 55% here, you can uh, replace with imports from other countries, in particular, say, Norway or the Netherlands. Uh, some of uh, these 55% are also used in electricity generation. Um, and uh, from, you know, what I've been told, you can uh, essentially 
uh, substitute that gas that's used in electricity generation with other uh, energy sources. So you can burn other things, so in particular lignite, say. Um, uh, when our energy economist uh, uh, team members counted up these numbers and relied on some estimates in literature, the number they came up with is essentially that you, while you lose 55% of the gas, you can import or substitute 25% so that in the end, the gas shock is essentially uh, 30%. So uh, for all the following analysis, essentially what we're gonna work with is uh, the following energy shock here, which is a 30% decline in gas, uh, or equivalently, if you, you know, calculate that up to the total terawatt hours uh, generated by gas, oil, and coal, it's gonna be sort of an eight or maybe 10% uh, drop in, in, in total energy of, or fossil fuels, I guess. Just to clarify, you assume that the, the three power plants which are still active until the end of the year will be extended or in, in, in your analysis or not? I honestly forget the answer to this. Uh, I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, this is a, a question for... Uh, and then the sanctions, you, if you look at the sanctions, if they have to go over the next winter, then the numbers will be much larger. So it's only if the sanctions last during the summer. Is this correct in your analysis? No, 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 no. The, the scenario we're always gonna do is um, you put the sanctions now and you put them in place forever. Forever, uh, okay. And then, well, or for, forever. And then no, it's- but let's a, say for a long time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it's a sort of, a, a, the numbers I'm gonna say, like our GDP loss, say in the first year. Um, and then I guess in the second year, you'd get another uh, GDP loss, right? But that in the second year, you'd think that maybe that GDP loss would actually be less than in the first year. Why? Because, you know, there's going to be more, uh, you know, adaptability and substitution as time progresses. Um, you said yeah. roughly until next winter. So, so, but you go over the winter then or not in your numbers? The sanctions are going to go over the winter. Yeah, yeah. No, this is only sort of uh, to say how much uh, uh, time uh, do we, you know, give ourselves here to you know, no make up for some of this 55% gas gap. Okay. Okay. The point here is that the seasonality works in our favor, right? If now we're in the middle of winter, um, it'd be much harder. Um, why? Okay. Because gas demand would be high. So that's kind of the point here. But yeah, the, the experiment is always put the sanctions in place now and keep them for a long time. Um, it's not, uh, you know, putting them in place temporarily. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Okay, so here's the plan for the remainder of the talk. Um, so I wanted to give you some facts about the German economy and its energy dependence. Um, then sort of essentially starting from these facts, we're gonna map this sort of energy shock, so minus 30% gas or eight or 10% total energy into some aggregate uh, uh, macroeconomic losses. So uh, GDP or gross national expenditure. And there we're gonna use some macro models. Um, th there's gonna be some different models we're gonna use. Uh, there's gonna be a very simple model, essentially just the production function. Um, this is going to serve to highlight the importance of substitutability. Mark has already talked about this. Uh, we're going to spend in this presentation quite a bit of time on something that we didn't spend too much time in the paper, but we think, uh, you know, we should maybe spend more time when we revise the paper, which is uh, David came up with this very nice sort of sufficient statistics formula for that you can use in richer models, in particular with supply chains um, and international trade maybe. Uh, uh, and that's based on his work with uh, Emmanuel Clark. And then we're gonna show you some model simulations together with some back of the envelope calculations using these statistics, these sufficient statistics uh, for these kind of models where you have uh, rich uh, supply chains uh, uh, and international trades. Then uh, there's gonna be some more general stuff. For example, um, you know, just a discuss discussion of mechanisms outside of the model and other studies. And uh, I'm gonna come back to the question that was already asked, you know, what about other countries? And then I'm gonna discuss also a little bit this uh, embargo versus tariff question. Okay. So here's some facts about the uh, German economy. Um, the first thing is, uh, or the first three bullet points here are just some numbers of, you know, how much of the total economic pie in Germany, um, how much of these sort of payments, if you want, go uh, to these energy sources. Uh, and the point is, you know, the, the numbers aren't massive. So, you know, total consumption of gas, oil, and coal is something like 4% of gross national expenditure. Um, if you look at the imports of that, that's less. Uh, 
Um, why? Because, for example, some coal is produced domestically as well. Um, if you look just at gas, um, where all of it is imported, um, then it's essentially 1% of gross national expenditure uh, uh, goes to gas. Okay? So these are not huge numbers. Okay? These numbers must, must be fluctuating a lot depending on the energy prices now. Did that's you use, uh, what numbers did you use from the, during the COVID? Uh, we used, uh, we, that's, that's a good question. So we used uh, the last number for a uh, uh, year for which there was data, which was, uh, I want to say 2020, or I think it was pre-COVID. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. I should check this. It's a good point. We can take some historical averages, maybe, uh, yeah. you know, rather than uh, relying on one year. Thanks. Um, okay. But, you know, it's not going to suddenly be 5%, I think. Um, okay, here's some statistics on uh, gas usage and uh, uh, across different sectors of the economy, sort of households, industry, so that's manufacturing and construction here, services and electricity generation and so on. And then I'm going to contrast this in a second with, you know, their economic importance in some sense. You can see gas is kind of uh, equally distributed essentially across households. Um, industrial use, and then everything else, okay, sort of one third, one third, one third, um, and a lot of it is in electricity generation. Okay. It's interesting to contrast this just with how important, um, you know, these sectors are in, in uh, employment and uh, uh, production, um, and you get uh, numbers like this here, um, uh, and so one reason why I wanted to show this is if you, if you just look at sort of the total employment that's in industry in Germany, um, you know, that's 22%. So that's obviously large, um, but, you know, it's not 50%. Um, uh, and in fact, even in Germany, which is sort of uh, people have in mind as a very sort of industrial manufacturing intensive country, uh, way more people work in uh, uh, services and so on. Similarly, for gross value added, uh, you know, the number is a little bit higher, um, but it's still sort of a quarter of the economy. Um, the numbers here, obviously, in, in uh, bullet points one to three, as I said, are small, um, uh, but, you know, you don't want to just conclude from that immediately that the, the aggregate GDP losses are going to be uh, small, say, and I'll come back to this point. Why? Because obviously energy is a sort of a critical input in production, and so you, there's lots of amplification mechanisms that could be in place. Okay. Um, Wanted to show you one more uh, uh, table with data and then go on to the modeling. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, some uh, statistics of gas uses uh, and um, some other statistics across specific industries, okay? Uh, in particular, focus on the left-hand side panel here for a moment and ignore what's on the right-hand side here. Um, this is... Uh, you know, the three sectors um, of the economy that we think would be hardest hit in the case of an import stop. Okay. Um, these three sectors uh, uh, jointly make up for 59% of all industrial gas use, which again was uh, something like a third of total gas use. Um, uh, these sectors are the chemicals industry um, you, that comes up a lot in the discussion. It's the food processing industry and it's the metal industry. Okay. Um, here's some other uh, uh, numbers here, how many people work there, for example, and you can see the total employment here is maybe something like, uh, uh, you know, three, uh, three and a half percent of, of GDP, uh, of, of total employment. Um, and here's some other statistics, um, you know, gross uh, value added and gross output in these industries. Um, we thought it was interesting to contrast um, the economic activity and employment in these industries, uh, which we again think would be hardest hit uh, in an import stop, with uh, the three industries that were hardest hit um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay? Um, these are uh, air transportation and in particular hospitality uh, and entertainment. And the point we want to make here is that um, if you look uh, in terms of gross value added wages and employees, roughly in total magnitude, these sectors are kind of the same, okay? Um, employees, in fact, um, you know, you can count up the numbers here, um, are actually uh, quite a lot smaller 
uh, in these three sectors, then, for example, in hospitality is just big in terms of number of employees. But if you look at gross value added uh, and things like how much capital there is, uh, they're kind of comparable. Okay? Um, there's a big difference in gender. It's kind of interesting way more men working in uh, these sectors here than uh, 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 in these sectors. Um, there's two things that are um, obviously very important between the current crisis and the or potential uh, crisis in, in the case of an import stop and the 2020 crisis. The first thing is in the 2020 crisis, we shut down these sectors completely essentially, okay? Whereas now we're not talking about that, right? We're instead talking about losing 30% of the gas supplies here, which then maybe in an extreme case would shut down 30% of the production in these sectors you, you think, okay? So we're not talking about completely shutting down these sectors. Um, on the other hand, what's very different is these are very sort of up, uh, sort of downstream sectors that are very close to final consumption, whereas these here are uh, uh, very upstream sectors. So you'd think that if you, even if the shock is kind of small, this can sort of propagate through the production uh, network through the supply chain. So Benkin, I just compared with another crisis, which like the subprime crisis, that was always argued, you know, the subprime losses were tiny. Yeah, yeah. The banking yeah. was so central, it dragged the whole world economy yeah. down too. So no, this no, I'll, I'll, yeah, effects course. could be way yeah. more dramatic. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, that's exactly the point I was making here and I'll make a number of slides uh, again. But um, yeah, just, you know, just to put things into perspective a little bit, uh, uh, you know, I do think this, uh, there's something about this comparison that's useful. Um, okay, and another worry that comes up a lot is uh, uh, distributional effects of a potential import stop. Um, you know, uh, and the idea is that uh, poor households maybe have a much larger expenditure share um, on energy. And then if uh, uh, either the, the you know, gas uh, get, gets cut or the prices go up in particular, these poor households would be much harder hit. There's a very uh, uh, nice survey data set in Germany that actually has these very detailed questions about uh, uh, household consumption of these different um, energy expenditures. Um, and you don't find a very strong pattern across the income distribution. There's a little bit of a gradient here, you can see, right? Um, but overall, you know, um, this gradient here, or this, the, how the expenditure share varies across the income distribution is relatively flat. Okay. There's some other things that are interesting. Um, you know, uh, it differs a lot more with household size rather than, uh, uh, you know, just income of the households. Uh, the two are obviously correlated. Um, if you include uh, car fuels, which are not in this graph here, uh, then the graph looks a little different. In particular, it's actually sort of an inverse U-shaped, so hump-shaped with income. Why? Just because the poorest households uh, don't tend to have cars uh, uh, as much, essentially. Okay, so we're... We're not gonna talk about distributional effects uh, a lot more. Um, maybe we can come back to it in a discussion. Essentially, we're gonna say that, um, you know, these are maybe something to worry about, but it's not completely obvious if you look at the data that these are gonna be massive. And you can probably uh, compensate with, uh, with uh, fiscal transfers if you're worried about them. Okay. All right, so let me uh, come to the macro modeling part of things, okay? So again, what's the, the spirit here? The spirit is always, I guess, in quantitative macro is we're gonna you know, start from the facts, the type of facts that I've just shown you. Um, and then we're gonna try to map uh, this sort of energy shock that I talked about, uh, this 30% drop, or, or if you think about in, in gas, or if you think about total energy, maybe 10% drop into um, you know, GDP uh, uh, or growth national, national income losses um, uh, using these macro models. And the, the philosophy again, right, is gonna be to try to think hard about specific mechanisms um, like say these production chains or aggregate demand amplification and what have you. And then try to put empirical discipline on these as much as possible. Uh, and then sort of uh, try to see what comes out of it. Of course, you know, as Mark, Marcus said, um, there's always a lot of uncertainty um, about exactly what the sort of right parameter values are. In particular, a lot of these elasticities, you have sort of very local estimates. I and mean, then if you, for a very large shock like this, uh, 
um, you know, there's there's some uncertainty how much you can sort of use these these elasticities to extrapolate for these very large shocks. But you know, at in the end of the day, it's still uh, the best uh, game in town, I would say. And so so that's what we're going to do here. Okay. Remember again, just to remind you that uh, you know, gas is something like one percent of uh, G and E, and the gas shock is thirty percent. <clears throat> So I said the gas expenditure share is small, but of course the issue, right, is that essentially substitutability may be lower. It may be a, a bottleneck in, in production. Okay. Just to you know have some sort of a, a, a benchmark or comparison, I want to put on the table two uh, calculations that I think are sort of the two extreme calculations you could do. And they're also going to be, I want to argue, nonsensical calculations okay, that you don't want to do because uh, they're sort of just fly in the face of uh, what we know about empirical evidence. Okay? So the first thing you can do, um, uh, uh, which again, you don't want to do, is you could say, oh, look, like gas is 1% of uh, uh, GDP. Um, it declines by 30%. So we're going to get a GDP loss of 1% times 30%, which would be 0.3%. Okay? Um, that's a crazy thing to do. Um, why exactly? Because you know it would to completely ignore any uh, of these sort of O-ring or bottleneck or uh, production chain effects and any amplification. Okay. There's a very nice um, article or interview I think by Larry Summers where he talks about the financial crisis. This comes back to Marcus's point just now, um, and he likens the financial crisis to what if uh, uh, electricity were to go off. Okay, and uh, then he says, okay, electricity is only 3% or 4% of GDP. Um, let's say electricity falls by 80%. Um, then he says there would be some crazy economist would, who would say you'd only lose 3% uh, of GDP. I think he says uh, all the Chicago and Minnesota uh, uh, people would do this essentially. Um, and, and he says, that's a crazy thing to do. And I, I obviously, we obviously agree with that. Okay. Um, so you would think that it has to be larger than this. On the flip side, um, uh, the other crazy scenario to do would be um, no substitutability whatsoever, okay? Uh, so gas is a complete bottleneck, even though it's just one percentage point of uh, GDP. In that case, what you would get, right, is that GDP falls essentially one for one uh, with gas. And um, so if you have a 30% gas drop, uh, you would have a 30% GDP drop. Um, I wanna say that's also a crazy view of the world, essentially, okay? Um, now let's let's actually um, you know connect this with a little bit of economic theory, um, uh, uh, where you can sort of see this point nicely, I think. Um, and this is also going to be our sort of simplest model here, which is simply just the CES production function. Okay, um, so you have some output Y that's produced using, uh, in particular, gas and other stuff. Um, say here's some aggregate of capital and labor, but doesn't really matter. Some other factors for production. Um, uh, and the key parameters here will be uh, two parameters. So one will be the elasticity of substitution between um, uh, uh, gas and other factors of production. And the second one, so that's the sigma here. And the second one will be the share of gas in production, which is the alpha, okay? Now, uh, it's relatively easy to see that the two, uh, I wanna say crazy cases that I talked about here, um, uh, above are exactly the two extremes of uh, Cobb-Douglas production, essentially in which case this uh, calculation would be correct, okay? Um, and uh, Leontiev, um, so no substitutability whatsoever, uh, in which case uh, uh, this calculation here would be correct. So, you know, just to be clear, in principle, it is possible um, to have uh, that a 30% gas uh, drop leads to the 30% drop in GDP um, if you really think that all uh, substitutability is zero. Okay. So Ben, you, I guess you will open up this aggregate production function later on no? because yes. the other thing is I want to say, if you have a 30% drop of GDP, there will be political unrest on top of it. So it will be less, even more than 30%, yes. I guess. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, and we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll do something much, uh, uh, you know, richer uh, than, than this here in a second. Um, but I think it's still useful to give you some, to bound some magnitudes essentially. Okay. Um, just some general thoughts, but Marcus already kind of did a lot of this, so I, I'll go fast on 
uh, elasticities of substitution and substitution more generally. Okay. So one thing I think Marcus already literally said most of these things. Um, first, they're time dependent. So you know that in the short run, elasticities are less than in the long run. Again, I've already said what we want to think about here is um, a horizon, um, a, a time horizon for substitution that's roughly until the next winter. Why? Because we think sort of that's uh, uh, because of the seasonality and gas demand, that's how much time we have. So what are we going to do is we're essentially going to go to the empirical literature um, where they estimate these kind of elasticities. Um, they typically uh, distinguish between short run, which is like less than a year, and long run, which is more than a year or much longer than a year. We're going to take always the short run elasticities. Then we're always go, going to go to the very uh, bottom of the range of the empirical estimates, and then we're going to kind of divide them by two, okay, to get basically the, the, the sort of short run elasticities that we think are relevant. Uh, and we're going to have very low elasticities, but not zero, okay. Another thing that Marcus already said is micro versus macro elasticities. Um, so uh, macro, uh, in particular, takes into account not just substitution uh, within a production process, but also across production processes, um, uh, uh, or firms, so there's maybe sort of an extensive margin. So Marcus had this nice example with the two Leontiev uh, 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 technologies where you may still be able to substitute um, in the end. Supply chains, um, <clears throat> Marcus, I think, had literally exactly these points. Um, so long supply chains create bottlenecks, that's the O-ring um, point, but on the other hand, uh, the longer the chain, the more substitution possibilities. So these things kind of go both ways. The final thing that's going to be important, uh, not in the CES example, but in the richer models in a second, is potentially substitution via imports. Um, so the idea is going to be, okay, so gas is going to, uh, uh, you know, decline a lot, um, and therefore maybe it's going to become a lot more expensive as well. Um, it's not going to be economically um, profitable to produce some intermediate goods anymore, um, but you could potentially replace these with imports. Okay. So here's an example that comes up a lot in Germany. Um, so there's a production chain, which is something like this. So gas is used to produce ammonia. Ammonia is used to produce fertilizer. And then the idea is if the gas declines, you don't have uh, fertilizer anymore. Um, but you know what we would say is to a certain extent, uh, you can uh, import the fertilizer instead and then still preserve some of the downstream production. Of course, it's then bad for the, the German fertilizer producers. And, and the jobs that are in that sector. However, it doesn't mean that the entire system that comes after that collapses. Okay. Um, but does your analysis yeah. take into account that the fertilizer world price worldwide might be much more expensive? Yes, we do take that into account. Yeah, yeah, we are, yeah. I'll come back to that in a sec, um, or David will, in fact. Uh, we wrote a little supplement here on substitution that makes some of these points and also has some uh, historical examples of how economies uh, respond to large shocks. There's some interesting stories in there, for example, about airplane production in World War II, where in the US, um, uh, you know, President Roosevelt said, we need 50,000 planes right now. Everyone, uh, the economists, the industry people, everyone said it was gonna be impossible. Two years later, they produced 100,000 airplanes. Um, here are just in the simple model, so the CES production function, output losses for different elasticities of substitution, okay? Here I did a 10% uh, energy drop, um, uh, which is if you think about oil, go, uh, gas and coal combined, that's sort of the right magnitude. So you start with energy uh, equals 100%, so one here. Um, and so you say, I normalize production here to one. Um, uh, if you're in the Leontiev case, um, where uh, the elasticity of substitution here is zero, so the blue line here, um, then as I've said, you know, if you have a 10% energy drop, you're gonna have output dropping by 10 percentage points. Okay, so you go 90% energy means 90% output. Okay? Um, if you go Cobb Douglas instead, um, uh, you get this uh, much smaller number, which is essentially just the energy share times the shock. Um, and then the question is sort of where are you in between? What's interesting, I think, and uh, I didn't appreciate enough before you know, uh, uh, making these calculations is that um, because this gas share is small, okay, even with very low elasticities of substitutions, 
um, the output losses are potentially actually quite far from Leontief. So this is, for example, the red line here is an elasticity of substitution of uh, 0.04, so quite a low number. Um, and you can see that the output loss here is still less than two percentage points, essentially. Um, whereas with full Leontief, it would be 10 percentage points. Okay, we'll come back to this. So it really matters, you know, what do you think about the elasticities, uh, how, how small they are, essentially. Okay. Uh, and now I think uh, David is going to take a look. Uh, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Marcus and Ben. Um, so um, I think uh, the way that we want to think about these economies, though, is that they're much more complicated than the simple um, single CES nest would suggest. And so this is what Marcus was getting at. Real life economies are very complicated machines. Uh, there is uh, domestic supply chains that run across sectors and there's international supply chains that link these sectors to other producers in the rest of the world. So this picture that I have here is sort of an illustration of what uh, a, a modern industrialized economy looks like. Uh, each little dot in this picture represents an industry. So you could take one of these dots is for example, the chemicals industry, it's connected to other industries in the domestic economy because it's both buying inputs from the other industries and selling inputs to the other industries. And it's connected to the rest of the world through imports and final outputs where we think of exports as being part of the final outputs that these producers are producing. So as has come up uh, both in Marcus's discussion and in Ben's discussion, um, when you look at these complicated structures, it's not immediately obvious which way it's gonna go relative to the simple model. On the one hand, the fact that you've got vertical chains pushes in the direction of maximizing the damages when there's a shock. But on the other hand, to the extent that you have horizontal connections, that opens up the door for substitutability where you can escape the shock further downstream. Um, now, we want to ultimately be able to think about economies that are complicated like this. Um, uh, so Ben, if you could go to the next slide. Um, and my starting point, uh, whenever I'm trying to think about these complicated economies, is just to start off by thinking about maybe some sufficient statistics intuitions that are going to apply across the board to a vast class of models, just so I know what are the things that I need to be thinking about in order to understand the answer to the question that we're interested in. So in this context, we're interested in two key aggregate uh, statistics. One is going to be a measure of German real consumption of resources. So that uh, is going to be real GNE, gross national expenditures. And the other uh, statistic that we're going to be interested in is real production by German producers, which is real GDP. Now, these two things oftentimes get conflated in sort of the non-academic, non-technical discussion, but they're not actually the same thing. The way to think about it is that GDP includes things like the production of exports. So when Germany makes a car and ships it overseas, that's going to be inside GDP. And on the other hand, GNE includes consumption of imports. So when German consumers buy something from foreigners, that's going to be inside GNE, but it won't be inside GDP. And so these objects, because of the way that they're exposed to international trade in different ways, don't have to behave the same way. Now, our starting point for thinking about this, what happens in a complicated economy like the one I showed you before, is we're going to assume to start with that the economy has productive efficiency. So the German production network is efficient. Um, and then if you can go to the next slide, then. Then using that efficiency, we can actually come up with some very general formulas for how German real consumption and real production are going to be affected by a shock like the one we're talking about, where you cut off imports from Russia. So uh, what I'm showing you here is the beginnings of a, of a approximation to the change in re real consumption by Germany in response to basically any kind of shock you put in uh, into your model. So. On the left-hand side, we've got the change, log change, or if you like, the percentage change in German real consumption. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to show you the different pieces of how real consumption is going to be affected by shocks. So the first term we've got here is just what Ben was talking about, which says, um, if you reduce imports, so here M is imports, um, J is indexing the nature of that import. So this could be, for example, Russian gas, or it could be um, something else that you're getting from Russia. 
you take the shock to um, the quantity of the import. So in our example, this is going to be like a 30% reduction in your ability to source natural gas. And you multiply it by the amount that Germany collectively is spending on gas as a share of total consumption or total uh, national consumption, national expenditures. So that's sort of the first order term that uh, ben was talking about. And then if we can go a couple more slides. So the next two terms here um, on the top line, uh, the first one is the change in German exports, and it's weighted by the expenditure share in GNE, just as German imports would be. And the final term is the change in employment, um, weighted by the wage bill of the workers who are becoming unemployed. So this is a first order approximation that works as long as the initial German production network was efficient. And so one way you can think about it is if you think there's strong Keynesian effects or aggregate demand externalities or financial frictions that are gonna result in reductions in employment, that last term is what's gonna capture that effect to a first order. You have to think about how many workers are losing their jobs and then what was the wage bill going to those workers in the initial equilibrium before the shock. Now, if we can get one more. Perfect. So the term that, that we've got now on the second line it, are the nonlinear effects of these shocks. And these are really the things that Ben was talking about. And these are the things that uh, complementarities and substitutabilities are going to play an important role in disciplining. So what the terms in the square brackets are is they're basically taking into account the fact that when um, the supply of natural gas goes down in Germany, you would expect expenditures on natural gas in Germany to go up as a share of total expenditures. And the fact that the expenditures are rising is going to mean that the reduction in the quantity of natural gas that you have access to becomes more important and becomes more costly. So these deltas that you see, for example, the first delta on the imports term is telling you, you have to think about what is the change in expenditures on imports in response to the shock. And if you can come up with some either historical estimates of what you think that those changes are, or uh, you have a structural model with a detailed um, uh, assumptions about how production works, you can put a number on that. But as a starting point, I think it's very useful to just understand that whatever number you're going to come up with at the end of the day, it has to map into a sensible change in the expenditure share on imports for Germany. Now, the Leon TF case, just using this equation, you can already think about what's going on in the Cobb Douglas case and in the Leon TF case in the simple example that uh, Ben was showing you. In the Cobb-Douglas case, the change in those expenditure shares is zero. And so everything in the square brackets is zero. You don't have to think about that at all. In the Leontief case, what actually happens in response to a small shock to energy is that the expenditure share on energy, the, the model would predict, should jump to one. Because the marginal value of you need energy to produce stuff, it's like everything else is worthless now. And so the only thing that you're going to want to spend money on is energy. And so the model, the Leontief model, has these very extreme predictions about how expenditure shares should move and how relative prices should move. And I think that's why we think that's not realistic is because if you look at different historical episodes where there's been energy crises, either in the 70s or in Japan, where there was the Fukushima, you don't see such extreme changes in relative expenditure shares. And so your beliefs about the relative expenditure share are going to discipline and how big you think the effects are going to be. We go one more. Um, and there's an equivalent um, sort of type of result for real GDP, but I'm going to focus, we're, we've focused on real consumption uh, because that's a more relevant welfare measure uh, in our note. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So what are the key uncertainties? What are the key quantities that we need to be able to put numbers on in order to get um, a final answer? And I'm just going to go through the ones that we think are really important uh, that you need to take a stance on. Um, so the, can also a sure, of course. So you have, you know, different import sectors, different export sectors and so forth. If I make it finer and finer, does the approximation change? I suppose I put them together or make them finer and finer and have yeah, thousands so, of imports and thousands of experts or millions of it. That's right. It would change. What approximation will change now? Well, so it would always be this formula. It's just that once you start aggregating across different, so this, the way you should think about this is 
you've brought your economy down to the level where each of these J's you can think of as a perfect substitute with the other J's. Yes. So if you haven't, um, if you haven't done, if you haven't gone down to that level where things become homogeneous, then the first order approximation still works. That's the first line. But the second line is no longer true because- but the, In your numbers, then you look down at what deep, how deep do you go down? You have thousands of- So we break things into bilateral. So in the structural model that we have, we break things into a sector, um, sector pair by destination origin. So German chemicals industry buying Russian gas. That would be- the Then source. you assume essentially there are perfect substitutes within the chemical industry, even though um, the gas might not or not. No, we don't assume perfect substitutes within the chemical industry. We assume perfect substitutes within the industry uh, country pair. So for example, if you're buying, so Germany is collectively producing a thing called um, so whatever is the chemical industry output or plastics or whatever, that's right. a homogeneous output for us. And then when Germany is sourcing, let's say, um, uh, uh, petroleum from different places, we think of each of those as being an imperfect substitute for the alternative sources where you could source that energy. That makes sense. But can I jump in as well? But Marcus, the nice thing about David's sufficient statistics formula is that exactly if you want it to go finer, you can do it using the formula, right? No, I what see it David, in the formula, but I just want to know in your calculations how deep, how fine did you go? No, we because if you don't go so deep, then you assume more perfect susceptibility and get we, totally no. Yeah, we there we did it at the industry level, and we have thirty sectors in Germany, and uh, one of these is say the chemicals industry as a whole. Okay, but if I cannot move gas because from one chemical industry plant to another one because of the pressure is not there, you would not capture that in a sense. Is this correct? That, that's right. Yeah, so, so we do have, so as I say, for us, the homogeneous good is country, country sector specific. Nice. And that's really a data limitation. It's just, we're not able to drill any further. That's the most disaggregated data that we're able to but get. Can you from. adjust your formula, even without data, say, oh, I put another cautious term in it. Uh, just within the sector, there's also some friction. Yeah, so, so what I just want to say is I haven't mapped this to the data yet, right? The yeah. formula is the formula. Then the question is, okay, well, are you mapping it to the data correctly? Okay. Uh, and I think that's exactly, that's exactly the thing I want to highlight is the key sources of uncertainty in this formula, because that's ultimately when you want to map things to data, that's, that's where you have to um, make that connection. So, um, I'm the other thing is it's still a local approximation. No, it's still estimating. So where are the estimates coming from? Because if there are large shocks, things might be very different. No? That's right. So if you, so for I the wait. purposes of this talk, I limited myself to a second order approximation. We could have gone further. We could have done third, fourth order, but no, ultimately but it's still, it's still all these local. higher, you're, you're absolutely right, but all the higher order effects are all going to depend on how quickly these expenditure shares are changing. So that's why I think once you understand that, then you can say to yourself, okay, well, maybe I don't believe any given structural model so much, but I can also look at historical experiences where there were big shocks and I can look at how much these shares actually changed in practice. So you could do OPEC 1970. Exactly, so that's what I'm about to do on the next slide. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> so, so, okay, so the key sources of uncertainty are, are the three things that I've, I'm gonna talk about. So the first one is just the shock to, uh, the size of the shock, which is the reduction in energy imports. So that's the Delta log M, that's quantities. The other big source of uncertainty is the change in the expenditure share on energy. And that term is where all these issues about complementarities, the essentialness of these goods, the nature of um, import substitution and um, the production network's robustness, they're all gonna be inside that term. So any model you write down will ultimately have an implication for how that number changes. And that's the thing that's gonna discipline how welfare changes in your model. And then the next term that I think there's uncertainty. Do you assume CES or do you assume? No, it, well, in this formula, I haven't assumed anything about the, uh, the structural uh, production functions. This is, this is completely non-parametric formula. So the last term that we've got in here that I think is also important um, and there's a lot of uncertainty about is 
is a change in employment. And these are principally going to be due to things like negative aggregate demand effects. And Ben is going to talk about these in more detail later. But that's where you would plug that number. And so really, we have to just decide what these three numbers are. OK, so. And so these three things, these three terms are what I'm going to be focused on. Uh, so if we can go, with, go to the next slide. OK, so let's first start off by doing a back of the um, envelope kind of orders of magnitude type of calculation. So as Ben mentioned, we're going to assume that the reduction in gas in terms of quantities is about 30%. Uh, that's the amount that we think uh, we're, uh, Germany is getting from Russia in terms of natural gas, that it's not able to substitute um, to other sources. Um, and as Ben mentioned, the expenditure share on gas as a share of GNE and GDP is roughly about 1.2%. And this is sort of an annual number that um, it, it won't vary hugely from year to year uh, unless something uh, dramatic has happened. So how are we going to discipline the formula? Where well, our first starting point is to do exactly what Marcus said, which is to look at uh, the oil shock in the 70s and try to use that to discipline how much we think the expenditure share on, oil, uh, on energy might change in Germany. So during the entire period of the 1970s, the expenditure share on oil increased at the world level from about 2% to um, about 8%. So first, after the first oil, oil shock in the mid 70s, it jumped from 2% to about 4%. And then after the Iranian revolution in 79, it jumped again to 8%. And then it slowly came back down as we went into the 1980s. So there was a quadrupling of the, um, of the uh, expenditures on oil during that decade, if you kind of accumulate it all up. And so we can say, OK, let's imagine just as a back of the envelope that we have a similar thing happen in Germany, where there's a quadrupling of expenditures um, on, on oil in response to this shock. And if you do that, then you can just kind of plug and chug and see what you get at the other end. So the first order effect is 1.2% times the log of 0.7, because this is a log approximation. So log of 0.7 is roughly about uh, minus 0.3, like 30%. And then on top of that, you've got these nonlinearities that come from complementarities, which to add it on is going to be the change in the expenditure share, which is going to go to 4.8% minus 1.2%, that's 3.6% times a half, because this comes from a second order of Taylor expansion, and then the size of the shock. And if you add all of that up, you get something that's close to minus 1%. And so this sort of gives you a ballpark figure of what you should expect from a model that's able to match what happened in the 70s in terms of the oil, oil price shocks. To go further and put but additional- that's only, that's only the price shock. No? It, it's not the redistribution of the energy within the country. Is this fair to say? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by that? It's just, I have oil supply coming from, suddenly it costs three times as much and expenditure shares are shooting up, but I'm still able to redistribute the whole thing efficiently within Germany. So when you say I'm able to redistribute everything efficiently within Germany, um, it has to be, the, the thing that has to be true is that the equilibrium has to be constrained efficient. So what mm -hmm. that means is if you have some kind of quantity adjustment cost that you have to pay in order to shift resources, or if, um, uh, for example, factors are immobile across sectors or things like that, those would be taken into account. Um, what wouldn't, that would kind of, influence your the final number you get for the change in the expenditure share. Mm -hmm. What we're not taking into account is something if you have um, like genuine inefficiencies in like market power or something like this where we're abstracting from those kinds of frictions. Okay, so this is the back of the envelope. Now to give it a little bit more color, we can use specific structural models to basically try to fill in the numbers here. So if we go to the next slide. So this table sort of shows you different ways of getting at the same object, which is that change in the expenditure share, which is gonna be really key for thinking about how costly this is gonna be. The first column is just the sufficient statistics approach that I showed you, where we calibrated it using the oil price shock in the 70s. And we got something on the order of about a 1% loss in GNE, which works out to, to be about 400 per capita per year for uh, uh, German consumers or German households. Then on the, the next three columns are using different structural models, specific models with calibrated elasticities and so on and so forth. So the uh, 
this last two columns are the CES model that Ben showed you, which are kind of very simple models where you just pick an elasticity of substitution that's very small, like 0 0.04, and then you feed in the shock and you see what happens. Um, and you can either do it to energy as a whole or to gas as a specific input inside that CES bundle. The second column is a big structural model um, that comes from a, a paper that, uh, that I have with Emmanuel Fari, where we try to match exactly all the data on the world input output uh, network. So our model has 40 countries, every country has 30 sectors. Um, we match expenditure shares in terms of how countries and sectors are connected to one another. We um, use elasticity estimates for the domestic economy that are very, very low. So across sectors within the domestic economy, across different kinds of consumption goods between value added and materials, we pick very low elasticities. And then we pick trade elasticities that match what the literature has been estimating in terms of trade elasticities. And we just run that model, just sort of, a, if you like, an off the shelf model with complementarities that matches the whole structure to see what kind of number do we get? Do we get something where we completely off somewhere? And we find numbers that, if anything, are actually smaller than what the standard CES calibration shows or the back of the envelope suggested. And the reason there is because in the model, actually that substitution effect, the fact that there's lots of connections all over the place and everybody can adjust across different margins, actually winds up making the numbers, if anything, smaller rather than bigger. Um, so David, can I just, so François Kirov would like to do an, a, a different exercise. He would say, if you want to achieve a 30% reduction in energy or gas, how much does the price have to go up? Did you do an exercise like this too? Yeah, to um, what essentially. No, we didn't do an exercise like this. Um, so in, in the big model, I mean, so that it would come down to the effectively the, uh, elasticity of demand that you're assuming for gas. I think the question has to be spelled out very precisely because in these models, it's, there is no such thing as just sort of gas in, in this model. There's different sources of gas and different people feel differently because they're buying it from different places. Uh, um, but, but we haven't done that. That's certainly that's something that we can, we can experiment with. Can I what just I can jump in? Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. We did actually do this exercise in these uh, simple uh, uh, CES type models here in the in the end. It's in the appendix. And um, where we didn't do it is in your model, David. Yeah, that's uh, right. And and then it depends just on the elasticity of substitution, um, obviously, right? So uh, in particular, uh, with a very low elasticity of substitution, the price has to go up a lot. There's an appendix figure. Um, if you if you look at the appendix I put in the uh, uh, in the chat, uh, you, you'll find it. I, I think for the very, very low elasticities, which are probably too low, where we want it to be really conservative, we put a, I think the, the, the price has to go up by a factor of like nine or something like this. So yeah, I think that's huge, right. Factor it's, of a 10. Huge, it's a huge price increase. But the, the point there is that we think it's actually, you know, unrealistic and too large. Why? Because the elasticities are so low. And it comes back to this point that David made you know, whatever you believe about the elasticities is going to have implications for what's going to happen to the expenditure shares. If you think the elasticities are really low, it's going to give you crazy movements in the expenditure shares. And where do where do those come from? Well, from the prices, I guess. That's right. Uh, I just want to say we have to speed up because we're running already 27 <laughs> minutes okay. over. So, and we so finish in about five minutes. Great. So I just wrap up very quickly about what the model these numbers on the previous page are leaving so i think an important thing that i've left we left out of that previous table are aggregate demand externalities and reductions in employment but i think it's helpful to kind of separate the physics from the macroeconomic stability part of this so i think those first two terms that had to do with energy the reduction in energy and the change in the expenditure share on energy those are things that are determined by the physical nature of the production structure and then there's a different part, which is the macroeconomic consequences in terms of employment. And that's something that um, Ben is going to talk about briefly, but it's also something that depends on the policy response in Germany and the amount of um, fiscal support that there is. Nevertheless, we tried to be as conservative as we could, picking very low elasticities, 
having the elasticities, rounding up our numbers, putting in adjustment costs wherever we could. And, and nevertheless, we can't just, it's, it's implausible, I think, to generate numbers as big as, for example, 10% reductions in output and welfare. And I'm going to stop and hand it back to them. Yeah. And just to be clear, right, the, the headline number that we have, so 3% GDP loss, is essentially like the largest number here, which is the simple CES model that doesn't have any substitution via trade. Um, and then we rounded up that 2.2% to 3% um, exactly to have sort of a safety margin for uh, these amplification effects. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, in a second. Um, one little qualification also, the, these numbers here, they, they have uh, the substitution via trade. Um, we do think those are probably a bit too optimistic um, why? Because uh, we think, you know, trade linkages and trade relationships will take longer to adjust than just uh, say six months. Um, so, you know, probably these, these numbers here or maybe something like this are, are the more relevant. Uh, these numbers like 100 euros, are, is it a month or a year or is, it's an annual number? It's, yeah, yes. Yeah, we just took total gross, uh, gross national expenditure in Germany and then uh, say calculated 2.3% of that, that comes out to be 900 euros. Um, okay. Um, okay, so, so, you know, when we wrote the paper, then uh, uh, essentially a, a lot of people said, you know, obviously you're leaving out some things, um, which uh, some of these criticisms were uh, uh, fair, others were not so much or just misunderstanding uh, basically, but, um, you know, one that that's obviously potentially important and that we did leave out in the numbers that David had just shown you is sort of a good old fa fashioned sort of Keynesian aggregate demand amplification. Um, so I wanted to briefly tell you about this and particularly there's a nice paper by my co-author Christian Beyer uh, uh, with some uh, uh, students uh, and postdocs, I think, um, uh, here at uh, DIW who wrote a nice sort of follow up paper if you want about this. Um, essentially, what they took is they took sort of a standard Keynesian model, in this case with heterogeneous households, and then uh, fed in uh, sort of an aggregate supply shock that's meant to capture um, the type of shock we have. In particular, they assume that TFP initially dropped by 2.2%. Why 2.2%? Because that's the, the, the number we have here. And then they additionally put in a 3% capital obsolescence shock. So kind of a, this is a large uh, a negative shock here. Um, the other thing that's nice about this kind of model is you can think about inflation, which is uh, something that's important in the debate. Okay? So here's what comes out of their model. I'll go, go kind of fast. Um, so essentially, um, the, the key figures to look at here is uh, this one here, a BIP is German for GDP. Okay, inflation is just inflation. And essentially, they get that you do get some amplification in particular from 2.2% uh, to uh, uh, roughly 3%. Um, so that's the aggregate demand uh, uh, amplification. Uh, that's the, the mechanism that you know everyone has in mind. Um, so you know you you get the numbers are higher, but they're still sort of within this sort of safety margin we left ourselves by rounding up uh, uh, the numbers from 2.2 to 3 percent. The other thing you uh, can talk about now is inflation here. Um, inflation in this model uh, shoots up by a little more than two percentage points. Um, What's really important here, obviously, is what monetary policy does. Um, what's the assumption here? The assumption is that monetary policy operates the Taylor rule. Um, what does monetary policy do here? Therefore, it sort of leans against the wind and uh, rises, raises interest rates to sort of uh, choke off uh, some of the rising inflation. That's probably an optimal policy response to a certain extent. Uh, uh, because but again, when here the inflation goes up only by two percent, is this for the the time period? Is years or is quarters or months? This is years, I'm pretty sure. Um, and but I and inflation it goes up only by two percent, and uh, essentially only increase uh, the interest rate by twenty five basis points. That's it. Uh, no, no, no. The interest rate here goes by up by a hundred basis points, right? So it goes from zero. Oh, I see. It goes from zero. That's a change in the interest. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. Um, let me but go you don't on. Don't follow a Taylor principle at all. Essentially, you don't keep up with inflation, and it's assumed that the anchor never breaks. No? The inflation anchor yeah, that's is, true. is it, it, there. That's definitely assumed that the anchor doesn't break. 
Um, no, no, you, you do follow a Taylor principle. It's just that uh, that there's GDP in there as well. And GDP is kind of uh, uh, using oh, okay. sometimes. Okay. Um, okay, let me um, speed up and sort of work towards a conclusion. And just want to briefly give you a sense of other studies. So, you know, at this point, it's not that the case that our study is the only study um, uh, or this uh, together with this paper by Christian and co-authors. At this point, there's a, a lot of different studies with lots of different um, methods, some much more sort of structural macro models, some uh, very different uh, uh, methods. The, there's a very nice overview of the current estimates of this, in particular, uh, uh, in a report by the German uh, Council of Economic Experts. And here's sort of this survey table they have. And what I just wanted uh, to point you to is uh, this, this column over here, um, which has this sort of GDP reduction from different, so th these are slightly different scenarios. Um, but the point here is essentially, all these numbers here are something like, you know, uh, 2% or 1.5%. So none of these numbers are like 5% or 10%. Uh, there's also some inflation numbers here, and you can see they're like maybe 2.5%. More generally, this is just sort of a brief uh, reading recommendation. This uh, economic uh, Council of Economic Expert report, I just think is really very well done. I really recommend it. Um, they uh, uh, have both a German version and sort of a shortened English version. Um, they're, you know, obviously them being the Council of Economic Experts, they're, you know, quite guarded and put on uh, lots of, uh, you know, caveats and, and qualifiers, which uh, obviously is the right thing to do. Um, in the text, they don't have a bottom line number they come up with, um, but uh, Volker Wieland, uh, who's one of the uh, sages, I guess they, they're always called in Germany, um, gave a, a, a press conference where he essentially said, you know, this is means we think it would be three to 5% GDP loss of a full cold turkey import stock. Okay. I'm just briefly, again, wanted to say, you know, this is very well done and, and they really have a very good team of, uh, of economists there. Uh, and uh, they but the whole three to five percent for how long? For a permanent loss forever? That uh, no, I think this is just the first year. Um, I don't know what the assumption there is. Uh, how long it's gonna last? Uh, this is for, for over the first year. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Just briefly, if there's time, um, wanted to just uh, talk about some criticisms that we've received. Um, uh, that we haven't discussed it. I'll go fast with this one. Uh, Tom Krebs wrote a, a blog post, I guess, or newspaper, a little article. Um, he essentially uh, didn't like the fact that we have in our computational model, um, uh, which was the second column in, in, the, in the numbers that David showed, uh, th that we have the same elasticity of substitution in different industries. So he thinks we should have a separate elasticity of substitution for the chemical industry and uh, uh, that should be lower than the number we currently have that's 0 0.05. Um, I think that's a fair point. You know, in fact, what you can use there very nicely is the uh, uh, sufficient statistics formula that David just showed from the Bakai Fari model. Uh, we need to think harder about to do this, but again, it's gonna come down what you think is gonna happen to these expenditure shares. And I, we think unless you think something crazy is gonna happen there, uh, the, you know, you're not gonna get numbers that are bigger than uh, 3%. Um, here we also got some uh, uh, criticism um, uh, by, I guess, the, the, the chancellor and the, uh, the economics minister. These are sort of uh, signed referee reports, if you want. Um, uh, so so they, they said th these kind of things here, um, uh, you know, we're, we're forgetting sort of where is the gas actually supposed to run through, where are the pipelines, what is the regasification capacity or how big that sheer physics stands in the way of these macroeconomic models, the time it takes to build these pipes and so on. Um, I think these are uh, uh, kind of good uh, criticisms. Uh, I, I think a large part of this is not necessarily um, about our macro models. Um, you know, I do think it's important to emphasize that macro models do respect physics. You know, what's more physical than resource constraints and, and production functions, which we obviously have. I think the way to read this is uh, one of three things, two that are listed here and one that Marcus made me think of, which is, um, uh, you know, maybe what they mean is that the gas truck shouldn't really be 30%. Um, uh, instead, it should be somewhere closer to 55% because maybe we can't, uh, you know, substitute. We can't get this extra gas from Norway uh, and so on so quickly. Maybe we're too optimistic there. Maybe we should think hard about that. Um, 
Then the other thing uh, that let me actually say that first um, uh, is maybe a good way of thinking about it is what Marcus said. Maybe what they want to say is that we need sort of finer sectors and there's sort of a chemical industry in one place and a chemical industry in the other place. You need to uh, move things around. Again, what's kind of good is we can use David's uh, sufficient statistics formula. I like Marcus's comment that we can put in some sort of a, a safety term there under some assumptions. So that's a good idea. Um, another way to read this is, you know, maybe what they want um, is some sort of a spatial model uh, with transport costs, um, as in like Esteban and, uh, and Steve's work. Um, and so that, that's something interesting to think about. Okay. We have to come to an end pretty yep. soon, actually, because we're running already half an hour okay. over. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Perhaps I'll... one or two words about France and other EU countries and then... Um, so, you know, we did this, we wrote this report here for the French Council of Economic Advisor um, with Camille Landais and uh, Philippe Martin, uh, where we essentially used um, uh, David's computational model um, and just produced numbers for a bunch of different countries. The exercise we did there is two exercises. The first one is more similar to what we did in the Germany paper, which is um, just introduce um, uh, uh, trade barriers that basically choke off uh, trade between the EU and uh, Russia, okay? Um, sort of a, a, a complete import stop. And then you get uh, some GDP losses. And uh, uh, these numbers here, the, the, the blue ones um, that are labeled embargo. And the interesting or potentially problematic thing you get there is that uh, there's large heterogeneity in the economic costs um, across countries. In particular, there's these Eastern European countries like Lithuania, Bulgaria, so essentially countries that are very integrated with Russia that would have very large um, uh, 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 losses in terms of the economic losses. We, the other Does thing- Take into account there's this, among the European Union, there's this SOS agreement to bring gas across the union, essentially. Right, so there in the model, so in the, so in the model, we let uh, prices do their work. So, you know, the gas then gets reallocated uh, through, through the price mechanism in the model. So I guess there's an interesting question, you know, to what extent that would replicate what that, that agreement would uh, give you. Um, but here, the, the main point really that I wanted to just make here is we did another simulation, which is what happens if instead of uh, doing full embargo, you do a tariff. Turns out that a 40% tariff in this model, at least, is actually sufficient to uh, completely choke off um, uh, all energy imports um, from Russia for the big majority of uh, these countries uh, uh, here uh, to, the, to the EU, okay? Um, and you can see the, the tariffs here are the, the red diamonds. One thing that's kind of nice about the tariff is that the costs are much more equally distributed across countries and sort of smaller. Uh, on average, which I guess chimes with people's intuitions. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, you know, our conclusion or our, our message is uh, the cost of an embargo or an import stop uh, would be substantial. You know, 3% of GDP is obviously not nothing, but not catastrophic. Again, ballpark somewhat smaller than uh, COVID. Um, we think these are conservative estimates. We really like try to, you know, make all the elasticity super low. Um, the numbers we that, that generate the three percent have like basically no substitution via imports, and we rounded them up to allow for these amplification effects. Um, policy. Let me just say two words and then conclude. Um, you know, I'll pick the important ones. Um, you know, I do think it's important uh, to let the price mechanisms work. Uh, you know, we want uh, these prices of gas and oil to go up to a certain extent. And we want uh, people to substitute. Obviously, this comes with political economy problems, but you know, just from a purely economic point of view, I think this is important. Uh, you don't want to have the rationing plans that somehow let the shock fall entirely on industry or households. If we did some calculations, then it actually can potentially be much worse. Monetary policy should raise interest rates to control inflation. You don't want to tax uh, subsidy, um, petrol, say. Um, you know, again, given the size of the um, shocks, uh, uh, the economic costs, we think uh, a country like Germany with relatively modest um, debt to GDP ratios uh, uh, could potentially, uh, you know, use policies to um, alleviate uh, some of these 
uh, losses, uh, uh, in particular, avoid financial spillovers effects. What are the policy tools? Well, kind of exactly the same ones we've used during COVID. So uh, Perlo, so Kurzarbeit in, in, in Germany, you may have to bail out uh, certain companies. So for example, for the chemicals industry, I mean, it would, there's a chance it could get really bad, in which case uh, maybe you uh, have to bail out uh, BASF, for example. Um, okay. Okay, me... so let's uh, come to a close. Thanks a lot uh, to, to you, Ben and David, for outlining uh, your estimation procedure and the way to approach this thing. So we learned a lot. And I think we, we got a much finer detail now. And as uh, probably I would argue that there has a lot of value to do this quantitative macro models, but it also has a lot of value to do some other studies. And then as we put everything together, we get a richer picture how things uh, play out, uh, hopefully. At the end, we hope that the war will be over soon in Ukraine as people suffer. And uh, that's quite a, a tremendous hardship. And for all of you who were hanging out till the end, thanks for hanging out till now. And um, uh, just a quick advertising for next week. We have Elena Kivakova with us. She will talk about other aspects of Russian sanctions, um, probably more on the financial side and uh, how things really play out and how the payments are done and how you can get around it and why the ruble is still so strong and all the other aspects. And I hope to see you next week. And thanks again to David and to Ben. Um, take care. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye.